So I'm going to talk about Feynman diagrams, past, present, and future. So physicists are unraveling the microscopic laws of nature by colliding protons together and studying how the particles, elementary particles, scatter off each other. Today, the most powerful collider in the world is the CERN Large Hadron Collider. This is able to peer at the physical laws down to an unbelievable scale of 10 to the minus 3, 1 1,000th the size of a proton. For the past half century, the basic rules that we use to understand the scattering of elementary particles has been Feynman diagrams. If you visit scientific institutions around the world that study elementary particle physics, you will find blackboards that are covered with Feynman diagrams. In this talk, I'm only going to talk about one aspect of the Feynman diagrams, and that's how do you deal with the complexity of the calculations. So to show you what I'm talking about, let's consider the case of scattering five gluons. The gluons are the carriers of the strong nuclear force very much in the same way that photons are the carriers of the electric and magnetic force. So if you follow the textbook Feynman rules and you do the calculation associated with the pictures that are up on the screen, what you find is this. Now I've written this in a really microscopic font so it fits on the, on the slide, but in fact it's only a small piece of the entire answer. The answer goes on for 25 pages. Now, today, using modern computers, it's actually quite simple to do this. But if I gave you a slightly more complicated Feynman diagram, the diagram that you see up on the screen, then it would be extremely difficult to do that. In fact, no one has evaluated that particular diagram. So how do we deal with it today? Well, today we deal with it, in a sense, by not doing Feynman diagrams. We do something else, the modern unitarity method. Now, of course, I can't explain exactly how this works, but let me just make a few comments. So the basic idea is you have to take the problem, chop it into smaller pieces, and then recursively construct the more complex process using simpler processes. Another important ingredient that guides how this construction goes is you have to use the idea that the probability adds up to unity. And in fact, that's where the name unitarity method comes from. Now, if Feynman were here, he'd probably say, well, that's very nice, but what can you do with it? After all, if you have a new method and you can't do a new calculation, it's not worth anything. So that's what I want to talk about. Let's suppose that you said, I am not going to shave until I finish calculating a diagram. And let's say it was that diagram right there. And in fact, this is one of the diagrams that are needed to understand certain aspects of the experiments that are ongoing at the Large Hadron Collider today. Well, after some amount of time, you'd look like Longbeard here, because no one has ever done this Feynman diagram. It's too complicated, even on the most powerful supercomputers. And this is despite intensive effort from many groups around the world. On the other hand, with this new method, this unitarity method, the calculation has been done. In fact, one of the fellows who has done the calculation is up on the screen, and I want to point out that he's got quite a nice looking beard. The second topic I want to talk about is uh, quantum gravity. So expert opinion has been that it is impossible to construct a uh, a, a quantum theory of Einstein's gravity because you will encounter untamed infinities and the theory won't make sense. I'm sure you've seen this uh, written in many places. For example, Brian Greene's book would be an example. And the consensus opinion of experts is that by the time you hit three loops, and by three loops I'm talking about a Feynman diagram which has these three independent loops in it, then you would encounter an untamed infinity even in an improved theory of gravity known as supergravity. Now, in fact, because of this problem, in the mid-1980s, people turned to string theory because the way forward using Einstein's theory seemed blocked. But we have to remember what Feynman told us. Science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. 
Just because the experts say something doesn't make it true. You have to dig down and understand exactly why the experts are saying something. So let's suppose that we actually wanted to check the expert opinion. Then we would need to do some Feynman diagrams. So for example, at three loops, we would have to do the Feynman diagram that's at the top of the screen. Now, let's forget about the zillions of other diagrams that you have to do at three loops. Let's just talk about this one diagram. Well, if you were to evaluate that one diagram, you would find that it has around 10 to the 20th terms. Now, you should not be surprised that no one has done that calculation. By the time you get to four loops, we're talking 10 to the 26 terms. By the time we're talking about five loops, one diagram will have on the order of 10 to the 31 terms, which I'd like to point out is more atoms than in any computer. I think it's very safe to say that that is a calculation that cannot be done by anyone. So the, the situation was that the calculations that were needed to, to test the expert opinion seemed impossible. And this whole problem seemed destined for the dustbin of undecidable questions. Now, a couple years ago, my student, this is John Joseph here, said, well, I'm not going to shave until we finish at least the for loop calculation. Now you'd think he's taking his life into his hands with a comment like that. But remember, we have the unitarity method, a new way to deal with this problem. And we also have some very cool tricks that I'd like to tell you just a little bit more about. One of them, in fact, isn't really a trick. It's something fundamental to the theory of gravity. It's the idea that gravitons can be understood as two copies of gluons. Remember, the gluons were the carriers of the strong force. And we have precise rules how to make use of that. And if you use these new ideas, then the problem completely falls apart. If you now look at the three-loop case, we are talking about 10 terms to calculate. That, you know, who needs a computer? By four loops, we're talking about 100 terms. By five loops, we're talking about 1,000 terms in the diagrams. Now, there's actually, at five loops, for example, there's 1,000 diagrams like this, but, so it's still a little non-trivial. But you see the problem has completely fallen apart. And in fact, we've done the calculation at three and four loops. So we know what the answer is. The answer is there are no untamed infinities in sight uh, at three or four loops. We are currently in the midst of doing five loops, which we believe is the key to everything. Once we do the five loop calculation, we think we're going to unlock the problem. Unfortunately, I can't tell you what the answer is because we haven't finished the calculation. But one thing I'm really sure of, and that's that we will settle this 35-year debate. So let me finish up by just making a few comments about the role of Feynman diagrams in the 21st century. So the first point is that if you go around to laboratories and look at the blackboards, I'm sure that for the foreseeable future, they will be covered with Feynman diagrams. Nothing beats a Feynman diagram for the simple intuitive picture of how the scattering process happens. On the other hand, I hope I've convinced you that for, the, for doing the actual calculation, we do have better ways to do it. And finally, I'd like to finish off by a comment about computers versus ideas. So if someone came up to me and said, here is a faster computer, and we saw Bill Gates before, I'd say, hey, that's great. I'd really love to have one. I can do my calculations faster. But what I would really like to have, much, much more important, is to have a good idea. And I hope I convinced you that a good idea can always kick the pants off of a supercomputer. Thank you.